All right, so the first one I thought I'd start with today is vehicle tracking. Um, so this is all about swept path analysis. So there's really three things that you're looking to do here. So you're looking to um, predict, predict movement of different types of vehicles. So the thing comes with a comprehensive car and truck library, both domestic and international, uh, the ability to create your own vehicles so when you have big haul equipment, when you've got specialized equipment, you can determine uh, how your access is going to be. Can I follow this road? And, and am I going to have? Am I going to run over the curb like they do over here at Wind Road when the big tractor trailer comes around the corner? You know that kind of thing. But two, um, you can do the same concept uh, for again like a site scenario. If you're on a campus, if you're trying to access some fleet to the back of a, of a building. You can also do the same thing in like a roundabout sort of scenario. So again, do I have the proper clearances? Can I design this dynamic geometry and then optimize it and then edit it and make sort of changes to it, that kind of thing. Uh, and then it also does some parking layout stuff. So if you've ever been the poor cat in turn that had to offset the lines and do all those kinds of things to lay that out, there's a lot to it. So again, it's, it's built into uh, a lot of the Autodesk technology. It can run on top of AutoCAD, it can run on top of an architectural product, it can run on top of a civil product, so people that have the infrastructure suite or the building suite can add vehicle tracking to the mix. Uh, I think it's about 2500 bucks. You can network it as well, so you can float a copy of it across 100, 200 users, um, very economically. So here's the first part, right? So here's, here's that idea of uh, loading up a particular vehicle, so whether it's state-based or whether it's AASHTO-based, grabbing that particular truck and then being able to make sure that, you know, using the, the green outline is the chassis, the red outline is the body, and making sure that we can take a wide turn and make it through uh, a particular intersection that we've created uh, inside of CAD. Uh, and then being able to place along the way, uh, you know, instances of that vehicle similar to what you've seen inside us right. um, to allow people to understand that, that that truck can make that turn and you can fulfill any sort of exhibits that they may want you to use. You can also do design checks. So once you get the geometric constraints right through the horizontal stuff, then you may also want to have it run some more involved checks. And so they have things like steering angles. So maybe you're going to have to overturn the bus to make it, but you can make it. And so if that's going to be past what they consider that allowable scenario, you can look at graphs like this and you can actually see where those overturns occur along your horizontal and then you can go back and make your adjustments and then retake a look at the graph. Uh, and then here you get all the detailed information about that particular vehicle, its length. You can even plot down little profiles and be able to see what those dimensions actually mean to people uh, as you're going through it. And then you can do animations. So you can do the animations in 2D, you can do the animations in 3D. Here's an example of, you know, sort of the prep, the play and pause and reverse. And so you can do it in 2D, you can do it in 3D, you can adjust like a third person camera angle. Uh, and you can also change to a camera that is the actual uh, driver, what the driver would see, even the, the rear view mirror what they would see when they're backing into the spot. So here's us approaching the back of the vehicles. And there you go, there's a mirror view. So not much extra effort to get the 2D stuff to be 3D stuff so that the people that you work with that don't think like you do can see what's going on. Again, if we're going to be a big logistical hub down here with things like I-11, these things are going to be you know, powerful tools and stuff all that. Yeah. Well, when you want to optimize a campus, in this case a parking lot, for example, you can see you get all these different types of grips. So you can easily kind of click to lay out these, these parking lot lines. Then you can come back and you can adjust the ends with all these different types of grips. And then you can use various routines to make parallel sets of those lanes. Uh, and then down here, when you look at the roundabout sort of a scenario, you can start with just simply two alignments, and we'll show you this in the demo. Uh, and then you can change the center point, or you can adjust the offset, or you can change the taper, or you can change the radius, and then everything's kind of connected together, and everything's going to move just the way you want it to do. Then when you want to edit it in even a more detailed way, you can get this entire dialog box that allows you to do 
uh, all sorts of things with the crosswalks and the islands and the grades and the approach. And, uh, you can go through and adjust every little single nook and cranny if, if your uh, roundabouts transportation is sort of your, your niche. And then it gives you these graphics to help you understand what exact little parameters you're changing as you go through the process. And then because it's built on the Autodesk technology, it has special capability to interact with Civil 3D. So uh, to leverage those alignments, to generate those corridors after the fact from just the parameters that were provided uh, as part of the roundabout to be able to take that truck or that car and tell it to follow uh, you know, this, this road or to follow this road with just a couple of clicks um, to get surface information uh, to have everything kind of built out for you. And then throughout the, the product, you also get a lot of this real-time feedback. So in this case, as you're making grip edit changes, uh, you can see it give you all the feedback in terms of what sort of speeds can be maintained as you make certain types of adjustments uh, to the roundabout. Another example of uh, analysis would be the ability to take a look at sight lines. So as we're talking about this particular intersection, to be able to see what we can see and what we can't see from any particular truck manage point, using basic standard speeds and uh, built in the, in the product. So those are kind of the three things that it, it it prides itself in doing. Let's let's take you into the, the product a little bit and show you around. The first one is the school bus scenario. So this is just we're we're putting in this new apartment site, um, coming down this road. Now that I've created this road and this roundabout, uh, will my bus be able to make that turn and navigate that newly constructed roadway? So you know, vehicle tracking is just sort of this extra tab that's in the ribbon now that's got all these different features on it. The first one they're using is auto drive. So that's just the idea of picking a particular vehicle from the library, get a chance to take a look at that information uh, in a diagram sense. And then incorporating that into the drawing. So here we have to place it, and then we have to sort of align it with the, with, with the road. And then we can pick a series of points uh, as we feel this thing's going to navigate. As we get to the turn, we can go ahead and make those a little bit tighter. And again, I'm getting those red and green lines so that I understand where that vehicle's going to be. If at any point I lose those lines, uh, then I know I've got some sort of a break that's not going to work. We'll see that here. Just a sec. Lots of grips along the way there that allow you to go back and manage it. So as long as that brick is a drivable surface, if it's flush like they do with some of the roundabouts, you're okay. So I'm gonna say, is it paying attention to the to the alignment materials and stuff as you're doing this? In this, it's just this. See, there's an example where if you grip edit it, it's not working. Um, in this case, this is just more of an AutoCAD-based drawing like an AutoCAD map sort of scenario. So it doesn't really have any sort of alignment intelligence. It's just got this, this line work. Um, and so this is more of a visual inspection kind of a scenario. It's going to do it like correct itself if you went outside the boundary of the line. Yeah. Sure. You'll see an example of that coming a little bit, bit later. Um, so again, you just go through there, you make some adjustments. Now it looks 2D, it looks okay, but then if you run the design check, it takes like that other next step in terms of looking at it. This is where it determines that there's sort of an oversteer. So I really don't understand what that, that is. Let's take a look at what that would look like. You select your path, and then you go ahead and drop in the graph. And then this is just one example of the different kinds of things that it can give you relative to the alignment. And so in this case, that's where they're oversteering. And so 
it may be permissible, it may not be, but at least you know a little bit more than just what the 2D stuff looks like. All right, so next example. So this is the site example. So we got the 30-foot rigid truck. We're trying to make sure that it can access the loading dock. Pretty typical scenario. We got to come in off the main road, into the parking lot, and then back up. So again, we're just using the auto draw. We can be kind of liberal as we kind of go from step to step. Now we can start leveraging geometry in the drawing to tell this thing to follow those alignments. So first we're going to use the center of the drive, then we're going to align ourselves with the edge of the parking lot, and then lastly we're going to align ourselves up to there. And so you get less clicks and you get more fluid motion between those using that sort of a logic. And then you can always make adjustments from there. So we got the guy coming in, he pulls in, and then he backs up. Got a little problem there, but if we just want to do an overturn, again, I see these guys do it all the time on my way into work on the wing road up there. If they just hop the center line a bit, they can, they can make it without taking off the curve. Now, they've just done some simple extrusions of the building footprints there, and then you can do this 3D animated playback. Again, we can get that third party perspective. Uh, we can adjust the height of that, we can adjust the distance, uh, we can kind of orbit around it. And then you'll see them switch the target and the camera to a couple of different. So now I'm, now I'm in the driver's seat. Now I'm back to third party, and then eventually we'll get to the, the rear view here. There you go. Next we're going to switch over to parking lot layout. So we've got kind of an odd shape. You can choose kind of how you want to design this. There's a whole set of uh, parking tools right here. So you get your swept path stuff, which we've been kind of working with so far. Now we're moving into that phase two, that sort of parking scenario. So in this case, the product comes with a lot of standards. You have sort of a US parking standard. You can't make changes to that standard, but you can copy it, duplicate it, and then start to make some adjustments for things that work better for you. Um, so once we get into the standard, uh, then we can decide what we want to do next. Do we want to draw the perimeter first? Do we want to draw on the front of the building? Um, just using some basic sort of draw tools. So over here you can choose how you want to lay out your bays choose up the different kinds and then we're just drawing along the edge. Don't worry about the arcs right now, we can come back and deal with those. And then we just pick on the inside telling it that we really just want to draw the lines on the inside not the outside as well. The line segments convert to arc segments which is something the new AutoCAD products do. Um, so that will easily let you, and it's, it's continuing to make adjustments to those parking bays based on the rule constraints that are set inside it. Now one approach could be just to sort of take a parallel version of that and sort of set it inside. Um, you'll see that that's probably not the most sort of optimal layout. Um, that's not going to work well. So in some parking lots that might work great, in this one we're going to take sort of a different approach. Um, so you can just use a basic AutoCAD modify command, erase that thing out of there, and then decide to start generating some rows. And then now we've got something we can start to, to work with. We can extend it, we can taper it, 
again, it slides those parking lots around and creates those islands underneath those rural conditions. Now we can use the parallel command to generate that a couple more times, each time making slight adjustments to those particular banks of spaces. There's lots of other parameters that pop up in that dialog box, like the angle that you want the parks to be at, conditions around the islands. Just pretty quickly, a couple of minutes, and you know, we've got a number of parking spots laid out. We can go back and look at individual parking bays. We can make them handicap accessible. And we can do that for a series, and we see the spacing adjust for the codes that are there. Once we've got sort of a complete layout, we can run a quick tally, give me a quick report, tell me how many spaces of this I have, tell me how many spaces of that. If it's 152 spaces overall, it gives you a 5% if that happens to be your criteria for handicap accessible parking. We decided to go in and make some changes. Maybe on my, because here's the entry in the driveway, maybe we want to make this a one-way. So we make that 45 that direction. We can come back and make the other one 45 the other direction. We're going to lose some spots, but we can quickly go through that what if and know how many spots we're going to lose by making this sort of an adjustment. They'll come back up and we'll do another tally. I think we're going to lose about 10 spots. That's where we're somewhat direct pulling parking. Now, everything up until this point has been. 2D horizontal constraint. It can, <clears throat> as you start to get into more of the civil 3D elements, take a look at some of the elevation constraints. So we're going to be leveraging some profile information. We've already got we've already got a corridor created in here, so this intersection's kind of already been done. You can see those slices of the corridor. You can have some surfaces that were already generated from those corridors. So, this is the vehicle they chose to use in this scenario. It's one of these double articulating wiggly things a little bit. And you can see that there's kind of a low ground clearance. So, what we want to do is, if the horizontal turn looks okay, we just want to make sure that we don't maybe scrape bottom on the crown of that road. So we're going to place, you see that happen? <laughs> yeah, you get hung up. <laughs> so we're going to place a number of outlines of ver various uh, vehicle positions. But again, from comparing a couple of these snapshots to this, we can kind of see where those low points have the possibility of occurring. My wheels are, are low on this side because of the slope of the road and then the front's in the same position. So when I have that perfect storm, now all of a sudden I gotta worry about that clearance. So they've got a quick little ground conflict report button. And uh, when we run that path against that surface, it's gonna tell us exactly what that analysis looks like. Everything's green and yellow, so yellow means we're getting close, but Red would be, Bob got hung up, so I think we're okay. But, uh, but that's, a, that's a pretty neat feature to be able to take that third, third element into consideration. All right, so here is sort of a blank slate. You've just got a couple of alignments. This is sort of that third piece. This is that roundabout, that junction. We've got a standard to rely on here. That'll get us started. 
we haven't made any profiles yet, we haven't made any corridors yet, we don't have that stuff done yet. We just want to try and get that 2D geometry generated for that roundabout. So you can place that roundabout, it's going to have an inside apron. It's going to then ask you to pick a series of approach lanes to give it that, that access and it generates the rest of that geometry for you. If you do this in Civil 3D without these kind of tools, it's it's considerable more of work. Uh, a couple of releases ago, there weren't even roundabout tools, and that was just ridiculous. So then you got all these intelligent grips. You got all these opportunities, enough of insertion points, radiuses. Uh, look, it even dropped a yield sign in the right spot already. It's giving me all this feedback over here that I can look at when I'm adjusting various pieces. Everything's tied together. Again, more signage already put out there for us. You click on something, it tells you exactly what it is that you're adjusting. In this case, it's a lane offset. You can adjust what those radiuses look like. We can go to that dialog box and actually take a look at all the roundabout parameters. That's over the overall picture, and then as we start to drill into the particular lanes, each leg is going to take me right to that, that quadrant and allow me to make changes to lane widths, additional pop out lanes, adding them the island geometry in so they have all those curb lines. Want to put in a crosswalk. Crosswalk knows where it's supposed to be, knows where it's not supposed to be. Gives me distances back to a certain location has accompanied signage to go with the crosswalk. Anybody want to go back to school to be a transportation engineer, I guess? <laughs> now you could take this whole set of 2D geometry that's dynamic and connected, and you could then generate the alignments, the profiles, and even the corridor for all these pieces and parts. So in the end, we have this 3D object that's up at elevation. It's and then we can demonstrate a couple of vehicles. We gotta make a couple surfaces first so we've got some 3D information. So just a quick surface and boundary from the corridor. some additional mappings to the uh, finished grade surface. We're going to pick a couple vehicles. I'm going to take a tr semi truck, tractor trailer, and then we're going to take a, just a passenger car. And just and again, now since we have alignments, this is what you're asking about before. See how it just snaps that thing right in. It knows where it needs to be within the lane. And then I don't have to pick a bunch of points in between. I can just snap into that other alignment, and then it's going to take me through the roundabout the way I would need to go. 
and then I don't have to worry about staying in my lane and fine tuning any of that stuff. It's pretty uh, pretty sexy uh, passenger car there. Nineteen ninety two sedan or something. There we go. And then we could animate this thing. So just look at it in 2D and then tip it up into 3D. And again, just have a couple of perspectives. Okay, InfraWorks 360. So there's actually two flavors of InfraWorks. There's the InfraWorks that comes in the suites that you have. And then there's the InfraWorks 360, which you can actually get as a subscription on a monthly quarterly, annual basis. Uh, the 360 platform, they are going to be building out with all these various modules that you can get to it. So there'll be a few points in here that I'll kind of differentiate between things that are already in the bucket that you have and then things that you would have to pay something more to acquire. Uh, so InfraWorks is a great product for probably 80% of the stuff that I'm going to show you, especially for people that already have it. The cool part about InfoWorks 360 is if you don't have a legacy traditional purchase of these tools, you can get into just a sliver of it and you can get into it for just a period of time just to get your feet wet just for a project. Or you're going to bring an intern on for the summer or you're going to bring somebody on for a six month project. You don't have these years of maintenance fees to deal with after the fact. So that's sort of the, the 360 to Autodesk world means the cloud. Um, so it takes advantage of some of that stuff and that hosted component, but it is a desktop application uh, that has some of those uh, tentacles into leveraging the cloud, and it's also coming to you in sort of a more convenient buying mechanism than you're accustomed to. Uh, let's move on to what ifs. Real world context. So, so much, uh, so much GIS information either freely available or in your enterprise systems that just doesn't frankly get leveraged enough. Um, you know, what if you could just pop all your buildings up uh, based on a, on a generic height? Or even better, an actual GIS attributed height. Uh, what if you could do a quick theming, but in sort of a 3D uh, you know, environment? Um, so you've got the context. You know, putting your project in context, whether it's just a single building or a single corridor improvement or something like that. Looking at multiple options, giving a customer A, B, C, being able to take those things to public outreach uh, meetings so that you can make informed decisions both from a professional but also from a public standpoint. Um, again, understanding helps the stakeholders in the project and the collaborators better understand models, then 2D drawings, uh, and hopefully that gets everybody moving quicker to working on that particular project. Uh, again, InfraWorks is uh, large scale. So, in any time you've ever dealt with uh, terrains, you immediately think of something that's heavy, and I can't deal with a lot of it because my computer's going to throw up, right? Um, this data can be a campus, this can be uh, a community, this can be a city, it can be half of a state of California. Uh, the engine can handle a lot of data in a very lightweight fashion. Uh, the cloud comes into play if uh, John wants to have a copy of the model on his computer and upload it to the cloud, and then I want to pull down a copy from the cloud onto my computer, and then I put up proposal A, and then he puts up proposal B, and then Lewis puts up proposal C. So that's how we can be outside the firewall communicating these, uh, these types of designs. Um, and then we can take these things to a web browser, to an iPad, and allow people to give us feedback um, as well. So again, large scale models, uh, leverage existing data, so we see terrain, uh, we see ortho imagery, aerial imagery of some sort, we might have point clouds, we might have centerline road data, we might have uh, water, sewer, other kinds of things above the ground, below the ground, I don't care, we just want to bring as much of it together as we can to create that backdrop. Again, you're familiar with a lot of these tools. Map, FDO, that's a big way to get started um, leveraging the existing information, whether it's raster, GIS, CAD, 3D models. Those 3D models can come from Navis, they can come from Revit, um, they can come from other places uh, as well. Uh, 
it supports Mr. Sid files, it supports FBX files, uh, and so on. Here's an example of downtown Seattle. So we were above the ground. I think this has to do with the viaduct project, if I remember correctly. This was done by PB. Now we were under the ground, and now we're taking a look at that infrastructure, and now we're back above the ground. And you can see it. these can be SketchUp models uh, as well. Um, generic placeholder models from just GIS. Uh, you can just plop something in there pretty easily in the product as well. So it's a pretty neat interface. InfraWorks 360, they've just basically got a few buttons up here, and as you click on a few buttons, you get a few more buttons down the side. Otherwise, they're just trying to stay out of your way. It's just you and your bridge. It's just you and your piece of dirt, you and your pipeline. Everything's very heads up in the way that, uh, again, you get little tiny pallets that fly out every once in a while, a lot of real-time feedback. Um, here we can take ourselves and navigate to any point in that project and be able to produce some sort of an exhibit that a stakeholder can understand. And we can do this in the, the web and mobile environment as well. Again, here's an example. What would you rather look at? This or this? Mm -hmm. Here's a couple other examples. This is a ramp. I don't see a ramp. It's flat. There I see a ramp. Those things are much more easy to understand than an intersection. That's like every intersection I've ever driven through in California. If there's three levels to it, this isn't going to cut it, right? Here's an example of it in a web browser with the ability to do those design feed comments back and forth between the people that you're sharing the model with. You can share it as like a, an email, as like a public URL, or as like a private URL. For those cloud share scenarios, we're going to be sending somebody something. You typically just take a snippet. This might be San Diego. Uh, so you're not going to take the whole model of downtown San Diego. You're just going to take that city block. And you're going to send that out, and you're going to get some feedback. So then when you talk about, you talk about the core technology of InfraWorks, which is bringing all that data together and then giving you an opportunity to sort of create different scenarios, different proposals. The 360 brand is starting to add these different modules on top. One of them is that collaboration piece uh, where we use the web to exchange the drawing or just a piece of it. Uh, these other modules allow you to get more in depth with designing roads. So instead of just sketching in a road, as I draw a road with road design, now all of a sudden I have lengths, I have radiuses, I have standards that tell me a local road has this kind of a K value, a highway has that kind of a K value. Uh, bridge design, so again, instead of just sort of artistically saying, I got, I got a pole here and a post here, and I'm just going to kind of hang this thing over the river, uh, bridge design will let me get a lot more in depth with that, that capability. And then now they're just starting to introduce uh, drainage design, so a way to look at a massive draining uh, opportunity. Again, uh, when you think about the valley here, uh, these things are necessary to deal with them on a larger scale than just a particular project by project basis. <clears throat> so here is the roadway design piece. So again, a road has a particular type. Uh, it has with that particular parameters. And you can do some optimization. You can do uh, a vertical roadway optimization. So it will it has construction costs, it knows widths, it knows cuts and fills, and it's going to say if we raise or lower the road here, so I can have this very simple layout. Um, so here's just laying out sort of in 2D what one of those design roads is like. Then you can come in there and you can start making changes to radiuses, either graphically or numerically. You've got grips that allow you to move things horizontally and vertically. Initially, uh, you know, uh, it was kind of draped along, and now all of a sudden you can see that you can go into a profile view and you can start inserting PDIs 
you can start raising and lowering those PDIs. You can adjust those vertical curves, and it's going to go ahead and pull that terrain on the edges with it. Uh, it's going to automatically build intersections. It's going to allow you to do site analysis on those intersections. It's going to allow you to put generic vehicle types through those intersections. It's going to bump out those lanes where it needs to to accommodate that kind of traffic flow. And then here you can see if I'm going from the uh, west approach to the south, it's going to show me uh, what those different colors representing different visibility capabilities are. Here's a couple more examples. You can see the different vehicle types. You can see the ability to then go back and adjust the radius uh, if it doesn't like something. Here's some more sightline distance stuff as we get into these areas where we've got these steeper slopes, where we've got these sharper turns, uh, being able to see uh, where we can't see, where we can't see, and then when we bring buildings into the mix in a more urban environment, uh, that, that extra uh, information is useful uh, to understanding the safety of that intersection. This is what I was thinking about earlier. So this is the profile optimization. So initially, just had a series of PVIs, and then once we ran it through uh, the profile optimization, this is what it came back with. Now some of these things, they run off these cloud credits. I don't know if you've heard about these cloud credits. When you first get your subscription going, they give you some cloud credits, and then there's certain things that sort of meter them down. So when you upload a job, it'll say, this is going to take five credits, and your 100 credits will drop down by five credits. And when you run out of credits, you can buy more. Um, but this thing sends it off to the cloud, crunches the numbers, and then just kind of emails you when the report's done and allows you to go back in and pull that into your model. So you can continue to work on other things. Th this product, InfraWorks, is closely linked to Civil 3D. So it's got its own file format, an IMX, that allows you to take Civil 3D surfaces and pipelines and push them out to InfraWorks. And then it's got the, uh, the reverse. So in this case, if we do a lot of, if we do a conceptual design of a road here, this is sort of like a plan and profile routine. So it just takes a buffer of what it needs, and it just generates for me a, civil, a set of Civil 3D drawings so that I can take a 30% submittal and just say, okay, here's our corridor, there it is. And it breaks down into a couple of tabs for some sheets, and here you go, take a look. Bridge design, again, you can get into more uh, capabilities here with a couple different types uh, of girder design. Um, you can add these additional posts as you want to within uh, the supports. You can take a look at the lengths and the widths, and you can kind of drill into clearances and other things that would be important to a number of peers, uh, elevation information. So you can adjust all of that very easily <coughs> using that module that gives you even more rule-based workflow capability. Again, here's another example, taking a look at different bridge design options. Uh, here's the properties dialog box in InfraWorks that allows you to take a look at a lot of the different uh, plate heights, widths, uh, spacing. Uh, and we've got some different scenarios here to take a look at. And again, we can check it out in profile. Here's that clearance when you're going over top of a road. You can drop in the vehicle if you want to illustrate that it's going to work. You can get yourself underneath the bridge, which is not a perspective that's typically considered or visualized real well. And it's got some, you know, it's got some pretty good detail to it. And again, here's just another vantage point. Here's just another opportunity to, to take a look at what the bridge would look like if we put it over the highway what kind of changes we could make to it as we go through alternatives. And again, that roadway data could have come over from Civil 3D. Um, here's an example of putting in sort of a flyover bridge scenario. 
And the thought process is we can reduce the cost if we're able to make good decisions early uh, before that ship sails, so to speak. Again, it kind of took the train with it. Once we tell it that it's a bridge, it'll kind of leave. We need to, we need to go across that way. And obviously, uh, piers in the travel lane are not, not recommended. Seats even got structure below. Uh, so we can go ahead and start rotating those and start adjusting the spacing of those. Here's an example of the drainage. It takes a look at that basin. Allows you to put in that box culvert to go under the road. Allows you to take a look at some of the elevation information. Allows you to take a look at some of the flow information that you're gonna have to deal with there. Make sure that you got your positioning right. Make sure that you've got your capacity correct. The watershed hydrology is using the USGS National Stream State Regression Equation. So here's another example of delineating the watershed. Again, we've got very large surfaces. We're able to use this to try to find a single point to be able to look at runoff calculations, peak flows, and so on. Here's just a little animation of how that might work. So we kind of just picked a portion of the highway and then allowed it to automatically select the culvert placement. And now it's showing us what that looks like. And now that we've got that culvert in there, we can start taking a look at some of the runoff values And then we could add pipelines or connectors to then decide what we want to do with that. And then take that into Civil 3D. Use that. So this is like starting from the start in Inforks. This is the, the landing page. Model Builder is really cool when you're on the outside and you don't have your own data to start with. Um, you, you choose a coordinate system for your model to work in. And just like map or civil or any of those things, it'll just transform whatever kind of data you get, as long as you know a coordinate system, as long as it's a real world coordinate system. It'll go ahead and drop itself right where it's supposed to be in the world. They use kind of an interesting approach. They use like a drag and drop approach. This is a bunch of terrain data from Esri, ASC files. Just kind of drag and drop several files. It's got its own sort of tiling technology and stuff, so it, it kind of knows it's already terrain data. So all you really need to tell it is what coordinate system it's coming from, uh, and then it's just going to kind of drop it in. Yeah, I've got terrain. Same approach could be used to go ahead and add raster imagery. Again, notice we're working inside of a coordinate system. We have elevation values. We take all the JPEGs and the world files. It already knows their imagery. All we got to do is tell it what coordinate system it's in. We're going to clip it because maybe we grabbed a bigger set of imagery, and we only need imagery as, as far as we have terrain. So it's just going to trim itself up nicely around the edges. Don't be alarmed. That's a lot of green. You don't see models like that. There's water too. I'll warn you. This is an SDF file. That's sort of Autodesk's geospatial database file. It's like a personal geo, geo database, uh, kind of Esri. Other water, other types. We have water areas, and we can choose the coordinate system that we want there too. And if it's just 2D GIS information, we can just drape it along the surface if we don't have anything from a, an elevation perspective. And sometimes, you know, when you move from CAD to GIS, you've got to make polylines that are closed, polygons. So now we've got some nice sparkling water going by with a little animated flow to it. That shimmer.
And again, you can see how fluid the movement is when you orbit, when you pan, and you zoom and stuff. And you're talking about square miles, square meters, you know, at a time. If you grab more than you need, you can easily come back and decide to just focus in on a portion. So in this case, they're just going to draw sort of a rectangle and just kind of trim up the chunk of the model just a little bit. Seeing where we're at is buildings. Again, it's super sweet if the elevations of the buildings are actually stored in the footprint, but most oftentimes they're not. You tell it it's a building, you tell it what coordinate system it's in, you can set a default roof height. It already randomizes the color of the roof and the wall material just to kind of give it a little bit more flavor. We're just going to get a series of boxes. We're going to go ahead and drape those as well. And again, these could be shape files instead of SDF files. It really doesn't matter. These can be live links back to your enterprise Oracle Spatial or SQL databases. And so that's what you can, you can see what those footprints look like with, with the random colors. Next to roads, again, all I've got center lines. I gotta tell it what it is, it's gonna be roads. There are styles, so you can choose different types of roads. Uh, roads with gas lamps, cobblestone roads, highway roads. You can make your own pretty easily. If there's already a coordinate system assigned, it's going to already go ahead and pick that stuff up for you. Whoops. This is what happens when you don't drape stuff. You end up in surfaces with these giant holes and the road's down at zero somewhere. It isn't so bad when you're only 60 meters up. It's really bad when you're 2,200 feet up. I've done it a couple of times. So it's easy to fix. Just go back in there, reconfigure that data source. Just go ahead and get the drape turned on. You can put tooltips in here so that when you hover over these streets, you can grab a piece of metadata and say, I want the name of my street to come from the name of that centerline file. And then when I hover over it, it tells me it's Decatur or Tropicana or whatever it might be. Next, we're going to bring in the underground utilities. This is just pipelines. Again, you've got two options. You've got pipelines and connectors, so you can bring those over sort of separately. Um, if you had Z, that would be awesome. Oftentimes, that doesn't happen. So what they decide to do, uh, you've got some different ways to display those pipes. So uh, in this case, they're just using gray metal pipes. You can use different colors to signify different utilities. In this case, they're just going to put an offset and then use drape. So arbitrarily, that water line should be three feet under, five feet under, eight feet under, whatever that happens to look like. And then you just drape it, put the offset in. You can't see it, but you can turn off the, the opacity of the terrain a little bit, make it transparent so you can start to see underneath it. You can obviously orb it up. So you can peek underneath it as well. So here's, now that I've got a little transparency, I can orbit underneath and I can see those pipelines are sort of draped. So if we're going to do any sort of significant earthwork, we'll make sure we don't dig anything up or conflict anything going across. So we just decided to lay this road down. Obviously, that's probably not the best scenario. So. Everything we've done so far is stored under master, so that's sort of like that background information. Now, if I'm going to start creating elements and trying different things, I can start building out proposals. That way I can easily toggle from one to the other. It keeps track of things that get added, uh, length of road, uh, 
number of trees, amount of water, things like that, so that I can then start to even cost off of those proposals, at least at a very generic level. So they've just taken the road that's there, they're just splitting it up, giving ourselves some extra vertices, making some easy horizontal adjustments to it, um, so that we can eventually uh, bring ourselves into putting one of those segments to be like a bridge scenario. So now what you do is you go to your little library of styles and you just take the bridge and you drag and drop the bridge on that segment and now it's got some different side rails to it. It's got some different configuration. Um, and then we can make some vertical height adjustment with those other types of grips. We can type that in or we can graphically just bump that up. So we took this 50 meter segment and we started to elevate it a little bit on each end. And the roads do a pretty good job in this case. We just got a minor adjustment there, and then the thing just kind of heals back up. So when you dead end one road into another, it tries to create an intersection when you take a road through another road. And we're not down in the, the sort of the weeds of exactly what that roadway is going to look like yet, when people are still trying to decide which version uh, they're really interested in. So again, now they switch back to master. That whole thing's been undone. And then you can go and create another scenario. So over here they want to kind of put a building in on this open piece of land. If you're going to put a building in, you're going to need some roads to accommodate it. We're going to build that underneath the proposal. So first run at it is just, hey, what if we just put a box there that was so tall and had a facade that kind of looked like that? So your easy, easy sketch rules gives you the rough area of that footprint, gives you some information as you're drawing around, and then we've got this just generic placeholder sort of box that we can adjust, whether that's move it around in plane, adjust its height, or rotate its position. Next thing, you want to add a couple of feeder roads. Again, you get to choose what those roads look like. Once you get a road in there, you can turn it into uh, uh, two lanes on the one side, one lane on the other side. Those are just easy property adjustments, and it just perpetuates that lane one more time. So you just click a couple spots. Again, creates your curb returns and everything for you, and then you're just going to draw back in this way to connect. In this case, we chose the one with the lamps, so you've got these linear features that you can have in place every so often. It's got materials, multiple materials as it builds out the asphalt and the sidewalk. Next, we're going to do like a, an adjustment of the, sky, the sun and sky. So again, we have a real location in the world, so you can do daylight analysis by choosing any time of the year and then any time of day. So if you're concerned if this building's too tall and it's going to make a shadow over here that this guy doesn't like, or if there's a view here that this guy wants in the river that this guy's going to impede, you can sort all those things out before a shovel goes into the ground. If you want trees, we can come over here and just pick a number of points, and it's going to build us a tiny little forest. uses a certain type of tree, we can change that out. It's got a density associated with it. We can adjust that to get more trees in that area. And then we can use the height to pull all those trees up at once as well. Now you want to add some additional city furniture. You can see there's a bunch of stuff that comes in the library there. They're going to drop it on bus, bus stop sign by the road, adjust its height, rotate it into proper placement. And then if you want to give something a little bit more real life scale, you can add uh, humans, 
little caricature of a, of a man just standing there waiting. Put yourself at any vantage point you want and capture them. Now, the next thing we're going to take a look at is doing some of the analysis of the GIS data that came across. So, we have this terrain, we can do some theming. In this case, we can do that based on elevations. So, they're going to look at different flood conditions. So based on the elevation of the terrain, they're going to go from blue to green. Green means I'm high and I'm safe. The darker the blue means the more potential that I end up in the soup. Yeah. And you'll get about six different variation stair steps coming from that river up towards those highland locations. So it just changes the some stuff down here, you can see what that little band looks like. And then we can just make sure that any sort of on-site features we build, we feel good about. And you've got that over here, and you can always toggle that on and off. You can make adjustments to that. You can see what that looks like. This is an example of what one of the emails would look like if you invited me to take a look at a scenario. And now when I load up the scenario, I've got this new bridge design, and then I've got this ability to take myself to a particular place and then play with that bridge travel looks like. And then here's where I can pull up the comments and I can give you some feedback.